Welcome to the Dear Katie podcast. This is Katie Kessner. And this is Claire Kaplan. Before we start, we want to remind all of you that the content of this podcast can be emotionally difficult for anyone, but especially triggering for the survivors of trauma. So please don't hesitate to reach out for support if you need it, whether it's to friends or family or anonymous hotlines. You can find resource information for survivors on the Take Back the Night Foundation website, and we'll give you that address at the conclusion of this podcast. Thanks so much, Claire. And let's start, as we usually do, hearing from a Dear Katie letter writer, um, someone who wrote to me along the way with their own personal story. So let's hear from a survivor. I was around 10 at the time, maybe fourth or fifth grade. I was sleeping over at a friend's house. She was my best friend at the time. Her family always welcoming and treated me like a member of the family. The night it first happened, we were both asleep in her room. Her on the bed and I was on a small couch in the room. I can't remember at the time, it was maybe 12 or 2 a.m. when I was woken up by her brother who was also having a friend over for the night. He woke me up telling me things like, I need to show you something. Wake up, it's important. I had never thought of him as a creep or anything at the time because I was close with the whole family. He's about three or four years older than me. He would have been a freshman in high school or in eighth grade. After he tried several times to wake me up with me refusing, telling him, I just want to sleep, go away. He took my refusals as teasing. Because I refused, he forcefully woke me up. He took my blanket and picked me up over his shoulder and carried me to their living room down the hall. He told me, we would just watch TV since I was so tired. And while he watched some adult cartoon, I closed my eyes trying to sleep. However, he would continuously try to keep waking me up. After some physical struggling, he eventually wound up on top of me on the couch. He would try to lean his face into mine. So I retreated backward into the couch cushion. Before anything progressed, his friend walked over past us while heading toward the kitchen. I remember it exactly, what he said in my reaction. As he walked by us, he simply said, "Oh, I was uncomfortable and immediately snapped on him. Help me. But he didn't. He walked right past us into the nearby kitchen. He then left. Thankfully, after leaving, her her brother was back to sitting on the couch. So I tried to make my escape back to my friend's room. I ended up rolling onto the floor between the couch and the coffee table. He then put himself on top of me, but he let me leave and go back to sleep. These type of encounters would continue to happen whenever sleeping over his friend's house. One time in the early morning, he tried to get me up again. However, this time the friend was sharing her bed. He came into the room and sat at the foot of the bed grabbing and pulling my leg towards him, saying the same thing over and over. I really need to show you something. Come with me. I refused. The more I refused, the more aggressive he would get, pulling my entire body from my ankle. And I was threatening him. If you keep touching me, I'm going to wake her up. And my friend was sleeping next to me. This seemed to work and it had him back off. As an elementary schooler, I had no idea of the seriousness of the situation I was in. I had no idea of his implications or what he wanted from me. Looking back now as a 16 year old and now remembering the events, I don't know how to feel. I've written this in hope of clearing my head. Thank you for reading. And now let's transition over to our guest today. Um, Liliana, thank you so much for joining us. And it would be great for you to share a little bit about your background and where you are at the moment. Well, I'm a 22 year old female from uh, Fresno, California originally, but I have since moved to Texas uh, and I am a full-time college student. And then can you share a little bit about what brings you to the mic today? It was because it was a, a family. The abuse was a family member and it was it was something that everybody knew but it's kind of hush hush Mm -hmm. so how old were you when this happened 
Um, it started when I was seven, and it went on until I was about eight or nine. And can you say who it was who was doing this stuff? It was my older cousin and a family friend. Do you, do you remember what happened, or can you do you feel okay talking about what happened? Um. Well, the first instance that I can really remember it happening was I was alone with my cousin, and he was babysitting me because everybody in the house was somewhere. I was staying over at my great-grandma's where he was um, because at the time he had been 16. Um, and I remember I walked past his doorway, and he made a, a gesture and I stopped and laughed at him because it looked funny to me. And he asked me if I wanted to try it, with him, that it would be something fun, a game. Did you even understand what it was he was talking about? No, no, I, I didn't understand. I knew it felt wrong uh, after he did it, you know, after he touched me and made me touch him. You know, I, I felt it in my gut that it was wrong, but I was little I didn't understand he molested me he never you know never raped me that was the family friend who did that and that that had been at my house where I was supposed to be safe in my apartment complex you know we were play wrestling and he kept on bumping and grinding against me I I didn't think anything about it because we were playing maybe you could just tell us how old were you when that happened I was uh, eight. How old was this family friend? 16 or 17. He was dating my older cousin. And in either case, were you able to tell anyone else about it? I didn't say anything. Um, because at it's right around the time when I was eight that my mom got sick with cancer. Mm. And uh, I still hadn't even really processed what had happened. It didn't come out until I was 10 that that it even happened. And even then, I, uh, nobody knows about the family friend to this day. Yeah, this is the first time that that gets aired out. Liliana, could you talk a little bit about where you were at that moment in your life? I was an only child. I still am an only child, so I acted like nothing was wrong too um i kept up the everything's fine because you know with a sick mom i i couldn't let anything happen um liliana i have a really big question okay um so many people i think have no they're like i i feel like the general populace says oh my gosh these sick sickos like they just characterize the people who abused you like your relative as sickos they'll just say oh these sickos but clearly he's not a sicko in your family um how did he come across as just normal and get along go along and if anything, why would you ever have a red flag? I, I want, I, I think it's really important for people to think about this concept of sickos. They're not sickos. They're like people who just sort of exist in our family structure. Could you talk about that? Um, yeah, well, he had always been a problem child. Um. You know, he stole and skipped school and uh, just did drugs and everything. So his normal was just acting, acting out. Um, and the family friend, well, he just turned it kind of into a joke about um, being, I, we joked about him being my boyfriend. That had been the joke that I had a crush on him and it just became like, oh, it's a fight between you and this older cousin um, for the the boyfriend. 
Well, and it's easy to make a joke about that. And people often joke with children about having boyfriends and girlfriends and think it's a joke when in fact, you know, when this, there's this underlying thing going on, how did it feel to you inside when there was this joke and you had to play along with that? You know, I, I never really thought about it until this moment. I, I felt, I, I just kind of kept myself locked away and played along with it just because that's what I felt I had to do. So, so my thinking then is as we move forward from age eight, like elementary school, um, into middle school, and then into high school, this abuse lasted until you were how old? Until I was 10. Or, yeah. Until fifth grade, right? Yeah. So then, how did it end, and how did you move through middle school? Uh, I don't exactly remember. I think it's because he ended up stealing things from my great-grandma and great-grandpa, who was on his deathbed. You're talking about your cousin now, right? Yes. The family friend had distanced himself. Uh, we didn't talk to them anymore, so that's how that one ended. Um, but my cousin, we got a restraining order against him because he was stealing things from my great-grandma. And that that was just kind of the end of it. And um, moving through middle school, it, it was just one thing stacked on top of the other that I just kind of... Uh, kept up my brave warrior face and kept pushing through and I shoved it all into a little box and just didn't think about it. Can you, I, I want to also ask another question. I love the idea of you thinking about how you sh- quote shove it into a little box. So if you could narrate a little more about what your abuse box looks like, I think it might help our listeners who are either, you know, trying to support someone or our listeners who are trying to figure out how to do their box might might find it. It still kind of lingers. It's not something that ever goes away because I worked so hard on compartmentalizing. You know, I put all the fear of being around those people because I had to be around them for so long. You know, family events, uh, seeing his face, the smell of his cologne, the smell of his bedroom, even. I can still recall that. Um, It's blaming myself for not speaking up. uh, Getting angry at myself for being afraid of coming forward when I know for a fact people would have backed me up. You know, I had family and my family bonds are strong. You know, it, it almost went to court, but... I, I ended up slipping in grades and and starting to fail, so I didn't go forward with a trial to get him. Still to this day, I feel like he could have hurt somebody else because of me, and they both could have hurt someone else because of me. You stick all those things, all that fear, all that anger, all that hurt, and you shove them back, and you don't think about it, and you black out those memories so that you don't remember so that sometimes it physically takes a trigger for you to remember things. What have you been doing for your healing? Um, For my healing, I have been working on grounding myself a lot, Um, you know, and whenever those things have come forward, those memories, I, I made the decision to start talking about them with at first it was a partner of mine um and my best friend um they got to hear kind of the specific stories and they were the first people that I ever opened up to about it Uh, and I had been seeing a therapist but I've been slacking on finding another one so to speak (laughs) is that because you relocated Yes. Yeah. Okay. Relocating made everything difficult, not having insurances. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I still work on myself every day and 
I'm around a very supportive network that whenever I get hit with these things, I could just go to them and blow off the steam, so to speak, and let it go. And do you find that that um, with school, which can be stressful, do you find that it, it affects school at all? Or is, are you able to compartmentalize those things? Well, I have moments where I'll go weeks where I'm having nightmares that leave me waking up and it's all about that happening again. So sometimes my schoolwork isn't 100% and my studying habits aren't 100% because I'm human. I can't 100% put it put it all away. So do you have techniques that you've learned or little specific strategies that you use for, to sort of bring yourself back to the present when you get lost in that way? Yeah, um, it's what I call my five things. I sit and I try to just blank out, you know, I sit and I find it something that I can touch and I start rubbing that and describing the texture, if it's soft, if it's coarse, if it's warm, cool, and then I move to what can I hear, what can I smell, what can I see, and that has to be five things I could see, and then what can I smell and taste. Liliana, are there pieces of those five aspects that you find especially soothing and helpful? Um, Definitely the feel. I'm big on textures and I like soft things. Uh, Fleece, flannel, um, anything that's smooth, like legging textures are the best. But even just having my kind of rough skinny jeans is another good texture because it just reminds me that, hey, you're here. I have a blanket that my grandma made me. Um, I think it was both my grandma's from my mom and my dad's side. Um, And it has the alphabet. And I actually took that with me when I moved um, because it's got satin around the outsides. And it's just got the alphabet. And I also have a couple of uh, stuffed animals that I have with me that are are a comfort for whenever the nightmares are coming. And I'm not afraid to say that. No, I I think it's beautiful. And I think people need to know that, you know, it's not infantile to have things that we need to hold and smell and have close to us, you know, no matter what other people think of them. I think it's really important to acknowledge them. So um, let's move into a conversation about where you are now, Liliana. And um, actually, I I do want to just close the chapter on your past. Um, The person who abused you, where are they now? And where are you now? I don't know where they are now. Um, They tried to add me on Facebook about a year ago, he and his girlfriend. Um, I denied it, Uh, and the family friend, well, I haven't kept in touch with anyone from that family. Uh, I kind of put distance, just because I don't know if I'm strong enough to face them yet. Not fully. You don't have to. (laughs) No. Um, I wish them nothing but the best. I mean... Yeah. You know, I, I, I want to say something more about that. Like, when I listen to you say, um, I'm not sure if I was strong enough to face them. I think some of us as survivors, we come up with these arbitrary to-do lists of things we think that we have to do to find closure. And so many of them are outside of ourselves. And I always said, I'm not going to wait until my abuser, my rapist says, I'm sorry. I'm not going to wait until all the people who didn't believe me say, I believe you. (laughs) If I did, I would never heal. And, you know, what I hear you saying is you're starting to realize the same. Like, none of it really matters outside of ourselves. We have to find peace and you know soul searching internally 
And how are you moving from that to-do list to the internal just satisfaction? I, I just realized that there is so much more to me than being the victim. I'm not a victim. I'm a survivor. And I like to put it behind me just because it helped shape me. I am who I am today because of it. And there's nothing wrong with that. It sucks. I shouldn't have had to go through it. But I made it out the other side. That's kind of how I look at it. There and when you say made it out the other side, um, could you tell us how that checklist looks? What does it sound like to you? I made it out equals blank. It equals feeling free. Um, I kind of learned to own my body again instead of feeling like it wasn't mine. It just started with loving myself a little bit more. I, I and did, did it take anyone else external to you to love you? Or could you find that self-satisfaction internally? I have so many friends and so much family that love me. And there's just this constant chain of love and adoration that I get. And I can't thank those people enough, you know? You got your best friends and, uh, you know, having your first love and everything like that. <laughs> um, that helps you kind of feel wanted. Your friends need you. Your parents and family, they need you. And I had people looking up to me. Little cousins looking up to me, too. So that really helped. Well, let's talk a little bit about... Um the dark days and how you get through those. Are there any tips and tricks you have that you could share for you? Um, I like to do a lot of self-care. Uh, on days where I'm really low, that's when I break out the scary movies because those those are my favorite. Uh, I love that. The scary, <laughs> the horror movies. Horror the ones movies. that make you like afraid of dying so I'm not dead. <laughs> Therefore, I'm going to live. Yeah. Is that where you're going with that one? Um, you know, break out the face masks, maybe take a hot bath with a bath bomb, you know, just um, listen to the, and if I'm not going to watch a movie, then play video games and watch or listen to music, uh, you know, everything that could bring me comfort is is what I break out on those dark days. Um, and making sure to surround myself with my support system too. I don't let myself be alone on those days. Isolating yourself when you're having those bad days is counterproductive. I just have one last question for you, Liliana, is, you know, where are you now? And what has been the most helpful to you um, in this journey that you could share with our listeners? Well, um, right now I'm in a lot better headspace, you know, working through and talking about it definitely is the first step. Don't fear judgment or anything, anything like that. That was always where the isolation came from is nobody will understand where I'm at. But now that I'm older and I see this has happened to so many people in my life too that just have someone there to listen to you because that's that's what I have found is the most helpful is having someone sit down with you let you take your time tell your story that's where I'm at is perfect thanks so much Liliana mm -hmm. um Claire anything else from you well I think I would like to know what are your dreams and what do you see in your future right now my dream is getting through I was the first to graduate high school. And now I want to be the first to graduate from college. I want to be a therapist and be there for kids who maybe have been in my shoes so that I can help them. Great. Thanks so much, Liana. Thank you. And thank you for sharing today. So this has been a fantastic interview with um, Liana, and thank you so much for sharing your journey and your story with all of our listeners on the podcast. 
and we will continue on with another episode next week. Um, This is Katie Kessner. And this is Claire Kaplan. And I want to remind our listeners that if you visit TakeBackTheNight.org, you'll find a list of resources and information about our legal support hotline and any support resources you might need for yourself or other people that you know. There are many walking with us in healing, in supporting survivors, and in ending sexual violence. This is Katie Kessner, and together we will shatter the silence and, and um, you know, the violence together. So thank you for taking this journey one more step with us, and we look forward to another episode next week. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.